In my last video, I built the hardware to interface a PS2 keyboard into the 6502 based computer. And the program that's running right now is just printing out the scan code of the last, uh, or the last scan code that was received from the keyboard. So if I press a key, like spacebar, you see that we get a scan code of 41 in decimal, and that's the scan code for the spacebar. If I release a key, then we actually get two scan codes. We get one scan code saying that the key is being released, and that's 240, and then we'll get another scan code telling us which key was released. So if I release the spacebar, what happened was we got the 240, it printed that, and then it printed the 41 on top of it, um, since those scan codes come one right after the other. And so that's as far as I got in the last video, which you can check out there if you haven't already seen it. But of course, it's not the most interesting thing we could do with a keyboard. So in this video, what I want to do is write a better interrupt handler that actually interprets those scan codes uh, and lets us print out the actual uh, letters that are being typed. So if we look at our program right now, all we're doing when we get an interrupt that says a key was pressed is we're reading the scan code and putting that in this counter variable, which is the thing that we're displaying to the screen. So I'll start by getting rid of all this counter stuff. So we're not going to count anything and we don't really need to convert to decimal or anything in this program. And I'll replace it with um, basically a keyboard buffer. And this is pretty common where you'll have a buffer where every key that's pressed gets added to the buffer. And then as a software reads keys, it reads them out of the buffer. That way, if the user types a whole bunch of stuff before the software is ready to read it, it can be read into that buffer. And so we'll have two pointers for working with that buffer. We'll have a write pointer and a read pointer. So whenever you press a key, it'll get put in the buffer at the offset specified by that write pointer. And then whenever the program reads from the buffer, it'll read at the offset specified by the read pointer. And so if those two pointers are the same, then that means that we've read everything out of the buffer. And if those two pointers are different, then that means there's some keys that have been typed that are in the buffer that haven't been read yet by the software. And I'm setting the location of the keyboard buffer in memory um, as 0200 through 02FF. So that gives us 256 bytes in the keyboard buffer. And because the write pointer and read pointer are both 8-bit values, uh, whenever either of them passes 255, they'll just wrap back around to zero. And as long as we assume that the user is not going to be able to type more than 256 keystrokes before the program reads from the buffer, we're never going to fill this up. So the circular buffer ought to just work indefinitely. So I'll get rid of all this stuff that we were using for converting the counter to decimal and printing it out on the screen and all that stuff. Get rid of all that. And the program is going to be pretty simple. We're basically just going to sit in a loop and load the value of the read pointer, which is just how far we've read into the keyboard buffer and then compare that to the write pointer, which is how much uh, has been written into the keyboard buffer by you know, someone typing keys. And if those aren't equal, then that means that there's some keys that have been pressed that we haven't processed yet. And so we'll go uh, branch somewhere to deal with that. Otherwise, we'll just sit in this loop. And actually, because these pointers are normally being updated in an interrupt, we should disable interrupts just for the period of time where we're loading and comparing those so they don't get changed right in the middle of us comparing. So we'll set interrupt disable and then clear interrupt disable uh, just for that, for that brief period there. And then if a key is pressed, we'll get the value of the read pointer, put that in the X register, and then use that as an index into the keyboard buffer to get the next key that was, that was written into the keyboard buffer that we haven't yet read. And so now that we've got that key in the, in the A register, we can go ahead and print it to the screen. And we'll just use the existing print care subroutine from previous videos. Then we'll increment the read pointer to indicate that we've read that character. And then jump back up to the top uh, where we'll wait for the next key. Or if, or if additional keys are available already, then the read pointer and write po pointer still won't be equal yet. And we'll just keep this process going until we've printed all the characters that are available. And then we'll just sit in a loop. And so that's the that's the program that I'm going to run, and it's you know essentially it's assuming that there's uh, keys in the keyboard buffer and it uses these pointers to tell us where we are, uh, but otherwise you know this is basically just a loop that prints whatever key is pressed out to the screen. But of course the hard part is going to be populating that keyboard buffer based on um, when we get an interrupt. So let's go down here to our interrupt handler, and of course this isn't uh, incrementing a counter anymore, so I'll rename this to keyboard interrupt I guess. And we're already loading the key into the A register here from port A. And so instead of storing it as the counter, we'll store it at an offset into the keyboard buffer. And then that offset in the X register will load from the right pointer. So this will put the key that was pressed into the keyboard buffer at the offset of the right pointer. And of course, once we do that, we'll increment that pointer. And now because we're using the X register in our interrupt handler, we need to make sure we push the X register onto the stack at the beginning of the interrupt handler and pull it off at the end. And we can only push or pull A, so we have to transfer X to A and vice versa. So that'll make sure the keyboard interrupt handler uh, leaves all the registers the way it found them. And we actually have some initialization to do as well. If we go back up here to the top, right above our, our main loop, 
we want to initialize our write pointer and read pointer both to zero so that when we start out, uh, they're both pointing to the beginning of the, of the keyboard buffer. And so this should work, um, but it, it does have a, <laughs> a, a pretty severe limitation, which is that the the key that it's that it's outputting, so when it's printing this character, what it's doing is it's assuming that the value that's been that's in the buffer is a, is an ASCII character, right? Because when we jump to the subroutine print care to print a character to the LCD, it's expecting an ASCII character. But right now, what we're putting in the keyboard buffer is just whatever we read from port A, which is going to be a scan code. And as we saw in the previous video, the scan codes are not ASCII characters. So ideally, what we would do here is we would do um, sort of a mapping between them. And we, we can do that. We can actually just set up a mapping table um, to map the scan code to a character. That way we're dealing with ASCII characters once we've read it in and put it in the buffer. So what I'll do is I'll just go to address FE00, which is in ROM, and create this key map. And it's just gonna be a bunch of byte data. And so this byte data will fill up 256 bytes in ROM, and each byte will correspond to a scan code. And if that scan code corresponds to a, a character, then I'll put that character in the appropriate position. Otherwise, I'll just put a question mark. That way, if we get a scan code that we don't recognize, we can just print it as a question mark. Otherwise, it'll print as the, the, the appropriate character. And so here we go, we've got 256 bytes. And uh, so for example, this, this letter C corresponds with uh, hex 21, right? So this, this row here is 20 to 2F. So the, this is 20, it doesn't have a character associated with it. And then scan code 21 is the scan code for the C character or for the C key, I guess. So in that case, we'll print a C character. So that's how this mapping works. And we can use the mapping up here because we've read the scan code from the keyboard and that's in the A register. And what we can do is we can take that scan code and put it in the X register by transferring A to X and then load the A register with a value from our key map offset by X, which is the scan code. And so that would pull a value out of the key map, put it in the A register, and that should be the character that's associated with the key that was pressed. And then that's what we'll go ahead and, you know, uh, get our right pointer and put it in a buffer in the, in the appropriate place. So if I go ahead and save this, assemble it, and write it to the EEPROM, and I put the EEPROM back in and reset everything. And now we've got a blank screen here. And if I press a key on the keyboard, so I press the A key, we get, well, we get an A, and then we get a question mark and another A. And that question mark is because we get the, the F0 scan code that indicates that a key is being released. So really what this is saying is we pressed A and then we released A. And so we press a few more keys. You can see we see that same pattern. So E, release E, A, T, release A, <laughs> release T, E, release E, R, uh, and so on. And I guess it ran off the screen there. But we're getting the scan codes and we're interpreting them correctly. And I guess if we really wanted to uh, sort of go the extra step here, we could modify our code to detect that release key um, and ignore the next character if all we care about is key presses. So to do that, we'll need a variable that indicates whether we've received that release key scan code that we can use as some state information to tell us uh, whether we can ignore the next scan code we get. So I'll just create another uh, variable here in memory at address two called keyboard flags. And then I'll have a flag called release, uh, which would just be that first bit in keyboard flags. And you can imagine we could use this keyboard flags to keep track of other things, like whether the shift key is, is currently pressed or, or the control key or whatever, things like that. Um, but for now, I'll just use uh, this one flag here of whether we've just received a release key scan code. And here what we want to do is check and see if we're getting that special key release scan code. So as soon as we load the scan code, we'll compare it to 0F, the key release scan code, And if it matches, we'll jump past all this stuff where we put the key in the buffer. And instead, what we'll do is we'll just flip the release bit in the flags. So that keeps track of the fact that the last scan code we got was that key release scan code. And then, of course, if we didn't get a key release scan code, then we'll just fall down here and we'll you know, put, the, put the scan code into the buffer like we normally would. And then, of course, we should skip this key release stuff and just exit the uh, interrupt handler there. So that's saying this question mark here, that this is the F0 is this question mark. It's saying when we get that, flip that release bit so that we know when we get the next character, in this case, the second A, uh, we know basically we can just ignore it because we, you know, it's just telling us we released the A 
um, but we've already sort of put the A into the keyboard buffer once, so we can just ignore that second one. So now we just need to see if we receive another scan code right after that release scan code, then we want to ignore it. So for that, we can just go right up to the top of our keyboard interrupt uh, handler. And basically the first thing we can do is check our flags and see if we're in that state where we just received the release scan code. And if not, then we want to go ahead and read the key and put it in the buffer like normal. But if we are releasing a key, then we basically don't want to do anything. Although we do want to reset that release flag. We'll go ahead and flip the release bit and update the flags register. And then we really don't want to do anything else. Although we should read from port A because that's what resets the interrupt. So we'll get the next interrupt when we get the next key press. But otherwise we don't really want to do anything. We just want to ignore it. So we can just exit the interrupt handler at this point. Let's save this, assemble it, and write it to the EEPROM. We'll put that back in and reset everything. And that didn't do anything. <laughs> oh, I see what I did. Um, <laughs> the release scan code is uh, F0, not 0F. So let's fix that and try again. Let's try this. Reset. And that's more like it. And obviously there's still some room for improvement. For example, shift is just gonna give us a question mark whenever we print it because we're not doing anything special to handle it. But let's see what it would take to handle shift properly. If we go back up to the top here, this keyboard flags variable, um, I mentioned we could use it for other flags like shift. So that's what I'll do. I'll use another bit in this flags to indicate whether the shift key is currently being held down. And then we'll track that. So whenever the shift key is pressed, we'll flip that shift bit on. And whenever the shift key is released, we'll flip that shift bit off. And that way at any point in time, we'll know whether shift is currently being held down. So flags will start out uh, initialized to zero, which did we do that? We actually didn't do that. So I should have done this before is initialize the keyboard flags to zero as well. That way when our program starts, it doesn't think we're in the middle of releasing a key or it doesn't think the shift key is, is currently held down. And then to handle the pressing and releasing of shift, we'll go back down to the keyboard interrupt handler. And basically when we read a key in, we wanna to check to see if it's the shift key. So just like we were checking to see if we got the scan code for releasing a key, we can check to see if it's the shift key. So if the key that's being pressed is the left shift key, then we'll branch to a, another label that we'll define down here called shift down. And then we'll also check to see if it was the right shift key that was being pressed because there are two shift keys on the keyboard and we, you know, each of them sends a different scan code. So we can need to check both of those. But if either of those is pressed, then we'll branch down to the shift down label. And the code here is actually gonna look very similar to the code for the key release because we basically just wanna set a flag so we'll load the keyboard flags. In this case, we're gonna flip the shift bit on to indicate that the shift key was, is down and then store those flags again. And that's really all we wanna do when the shift key is pressed. So at that point, we can just jump down and exit the inner handler. So that handles turning the shift flag on when we press the shift key. But now we need to handle turning the shift flag off when we release the shift key. So when we release a shift key, for example, if we're releasing the left shift key, we're gonna get F0 and then we're gonna get one, two. So when we get the F0, we're gonna get a keyboard interrupt with the F0, and then the, and we're gonna handle that just like we would releasing any key. We're gonna compare it to F0, and we're gonna um, branch to the key release thing where we set that release bit. Um, and then we're gonna be done with that first interrupt. Then the second interrupt we're gonna get, we're gonna get a one, two, saying that the key that's being released is the left shift. So we're gonna get another interrupt with that one, two. At this point, our flags are gonna say that we're currently releasing a key which means we're not gonna jump down to the read key. Instead, we're gonna basically do this block of code, which right now this block of code is just saying to clear the releasing bit and then just read from the 6522 register to clear the interrupt um, and exit. So at this point, we're, we're you know, this is the point where we're, re we're reading the key that's being released, um, but we're just ignoring it. But now what we wanna do is we wanna read that key and then check what it is, because we actually care what that key is that we're releasing, because if it happens to be one of the shift keys, then we wanna clear the shift flag. So we'll compare that value to see if it's the left shift. And if it is, then we'll branch to another part of the code that we'll write uh, for handling when the shift key is being released. 
And so now we're no longer just reading this just to uh, clear the interrupt, we're actually reading the key value that's being released and, and looking at it. And then we also want to check if the right shift was being released and do the same thing. So in either case, when we're releasing a shift key, we want to uh, flip that shift bit um, back, presumably back to zero, to indicate that the shift key is no longer pressed. And then once we've done that, we're basically done processing that interrupt. So at this point, we aren't actually doing anything differently depending on whether shift is pressed or not, but we are now keeping track of whether shift is, is pressed or not in our keyboard flags. And so we have a, a, a bit now that's indicating whether shift is currently being held down, and this will be kept up to date at all times. So what do we do about that? Well, if we come down here to where we're reading the key, you know, right now what we're doing is we're, we're reading the key into the A register, and then we're using that, you know, putting that, putting the A register into the X register, and then using that as an index into the key map to get a particular character code. What we want to do is we want to basically do the same thing, but have two different key maps. And if shift is being held down, then we'll use one key map. And if it's not being held down, then we'll use the other key map. So after we've got the scan code in the X register, we can check the flags to see if the shift key is being pressed. We'll load the keyboard flags and it with that shift bit. And then branch not equal, which means if the result of that and is not a not zero to uh, the shifted key. Um, and so if the shift if the key if the shift key is not being held down, then it will just continue and do essentially what we're already doing. So if shift is not being held down, we'll just use the key map to map it to a character, and then uh, you know push it onto the keyboard buffer. And I'll add a jump here so that we can uh, add some other code here in between to handle the shifted case. But for now, this label and this jump aren't, aren't actually really doing anything because it's just jumping to the next line. But in this case where the shift is being held down, we're going to jump down or we're going to branch down to the shifted key. I can stick that in here. And here's where we can handle the case where shift is being held down. And basically, we're going to do the same thing. And I can even copy and paste that line here. But instead of mapping to a character code from key map, we can use key map shifted, which is just a different key map um, that will handle the case where the keys are, are shifted. And so we have one mapping that's done if shift is not being held down, and then we jump down to push key here, or a different map that if shift is being held down, we would jump over that part and use this other map uh, to, to map the, the character code based on a shifted key map. So that shifted key map is just gonna be a copy of this key map that will change to handle the, the shifted stuff. So I'm gonna just make a copy of this and I need to move this back to FD00. Uh, so we've got enough room at the end of memory for both of these. So we've got our key map and then we'll have a key map shifted. And so I'll just go through this key map and for each of the keys, I will just change it to the shifted version, which you know for letters is just gonna be the capital version. For numbers, it'll be whatever symbol is associated with it and, and same with some of the other keys. And so I'll just change that so that we get whichever character we, you know, we wanna get for when we're holding down shift and we press the, the relevant key. And so that's pretty much everything there. So let's, uh, Go ahead and give this a try. We'll save it, assemble it, write it to the EEPROM, and let's give this a try. Reset. So that's still working fine. And if I hold down Shift, I get capital letters. How about that? So that looks like it's working. So I think I'll leave it there because I think this gives you a pretty good idea of, of what's possible. And you can certainly use your imagination to add your own functionality if you want, like pressing enter to get to a new line or pressing escape maybe to clear the screen. But hopefully with this video, you've got the tools you need to come up with your own ideas and uh, figure out how to implement them yourself. And of course, if you are interested in building your own computer, check out eater.net slash 6502 for more details on how to get started, including kits. And hopefully that 6502 kit really is just a starting point because you can interface all sorts of things like I'm showing you here with the keyboard and you can come up with all kinds of your own designs and it's really cool to see what people have been doing with it. So check it out. And of course, as always, I want to thank all my patrons whose continuing support helps make all these videos and everything possible. So thank you.